This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi friends, we have a situation here. Should I continue with FACO or should I convert to manual SICS? If I decide to FACO, what should be my strategies? Well, let's find out. This 65-year-old man with an intermittent cataract and the Rexus has run off to the equator. This video is not about the reasons for the Argentinian flag sign, rather than what to do once we have it. Okay, now first decision is to be made, should I FACO or should I convert? Now let me get this point very clear now. There is no harm or shame in converting to manual SICS or ECCE in such a situation. The decision to continue with FACO or to convert should be based on these following factors. Skill level and experience of the surgeon, density of the nucleus, other intraoperative difficulties like how good is the visibility, the amount of pupillary dilatation and the corneal clarity. And lastly, presence of coexisting pathologies like the status of the corneal endothelial health, pseudoexfoliation, etc. Coming to this case, the nucleus is not soft, but it's about grade 3 and does not appear to be very hard. I think it's manageable. The pupil is extremely well dilated and the cornea is quite clear, so visibility is not an issue. Well, I have been in this situation many times in the past and I am backing myself to meet the challenge in the event of any intraoperative difficulty. Well, I have decided to continue with phaco emulsification in this case. And let's see how things go. Before I start, let's understand with this present situation what can go wrong in the worst case scenario. The extended anticapsular tear can extend posteriorly beyond the equator and can cause PC tear which if undetected can result in nucleus drop. So before I venture to FACO, I need to be clear about my goal and the principles to achieve this. The goal is to prevent the tear from extending onto the posterior capsule and the golden principle to achieve this goal are number one maintain chamber equilibrium at every step of the surgery minimize the stress on the torn edges of the anterior capsule and abort phaco if situation worsens so okay enough of the theory and let's get in live into the action and try to implement these principles into practice the first thing I need to do is to enlarge the capsular opening. But before I do that, I need to decompress the bag. And we can see these areas of thickened swollen cortex. Carefully and slowly, the swollen cortex is gently aspirated from underneath the anterior flaps. Before switching hands, OVD is injected to prevent shallowing of the antechamber. Please note the position of the cannula. The OVD is injected above the anterior capsule. If we inject here, that is in the opening below the anterior capsule, the chances are the tear can extend posterior to the equator. Using a micro scissors, a tangential cut is given to the anterior capsule and I'm using a forceps to trim the capsule. The same procedure is repeated on the other side. I didn't want to make a very big opening, but this is slightly smaller than what I would have liked. But I've decided to continue with this sized capsule opening. I have chosen to perform stop and chop technique for nucleus management in this case. While sculpting, I am very careful that I don't exert any stress on the bag. I am using good amount of FACO energy to ensure that I don't push at the nucleus. I am also aware that I cannot rotate the nucleus before creating some space.
I thought the trench was deep enough and I'm trying to do lateral separation carefully. The posterior plate in the inferior half is separated but the subincisional half of the posterior plate is not separated. I am skeptical to use any more force. I thought I will chop and take out one piece which would create more space in the bag and then would be less stressful in the bag during further nucleus manipulation. Now instead of removing the first free piece immediately after the first chop, I become a little bit greedy and try to chop the remaining proximal segment. It wasn't such a great idea since it's not coming out because the posterior plate in this section is not detached. The part of the hemineucleus has come out of the bag. A better sense prevailed over me at this point. I leave this attached piece for now and then go and emulsify the two free pieces. Each of these pieces are pulled out of the bag and emulsified in the supracapsular region. The last attached piece is also eventually emulsified but with a little bit of an effort and the second hemineucleus gets dislodged into the antechamber. Anyway, it looks alright. The chamber is refilled with OVD. The dislodged hemineucleus is pushed back into the capsular bag. Since the bag is empty, the nucleus rotation is less stressful to the bag now. The hemineucleus is then chopped into two fragments. Then one of the fragments is pulled out of the bag and is very carefully and slowly emulsified in the supracapsular space. Now in this situation I need to be extremely careful not to have lens chatter because the endothelium is quite close here. This is a situation which demands an anterior plane emulsification which is contrary to my usual teaching wherein I always insist on in a posterior plane of emulsification. So reducing the amount of lens chatter is going to be invaluable in minimizing the endothelial trauma. The remaining fragment is emulsified in a controlled manner. There is no cortex to aspirate. The bag is formed with OVD and the lens is implanted. Let us rewind and try to summarize the basic principles to be followed during the situation. First and foremost, maintain antechamber equilibrium always at every step of the surgery. Number two, ensure that there is as less of a stress on the toe and edges of the anti-capsule and the bag as possible during nucleus manipulation. We achieved these principles by following these steps. Decompress the bag before enlarging the capsule opening. No hydrodissection, no nucleus rotation. Always keep an eye on the flap motility sign. After the first division, I remove the free fragment out of the bag and then emulsify it. This will create more space in the bag, which is less likely to cause stress on the capsular bag. Appropriate bottle height and phaco parameters to minimize antechamber fluctuations. Intraocular lens is placed in the bag and the haptics are oriented perpendicular to the direction of the anti tear. That's it. Thank you for watching and hope this helps.